Messina Covers is not just any other case company. David Messina and Erica Howard design and produce some beautiful cases that fit both form and function. And you can choose your case design, fabric, and trim color, add custom engraving, and more. And of course, you can find out more at MessinaCovers.net. Peter Pickett and his crack team of craftspeople are continually innovating and providing the trumpet community with spectacular options for stock and custom mouthpieces. He and Eric Murine can help you find just the right size to fit your needs, and you should definitely consider trying the acrylic cup and rim. And if you're in the market for a custom trumpet, then Peter and Eric can build a Blackburn trumpet just for you. Check them out at picketblackburn.com. To stay current on what's going on with Studio HFL, you can follow me on social media on Facebook and Instagram. And you can watch the live and pre-recorded interviews on the YouTube channel. And while you're there, go ahead and subscribe. My first experience with a Hammond design mouthpiece has turned into a bit of obsession. There is something very comfortable about playing one of Carl's mouthpieces. The comfort, response, and sound are part of the HD experience. Try one of the stock mouthpieces or have Carl make you a custom one. Either way, everything is better in HD, and you can find out more at carlhammonddesign.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you are, I would love it if you would take just a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts to leave a star rating and a review. Doing so will help improve the visibility of this podcast and draw more listeners. When I first tried an Eastman B-flat trumpet, I was blown away by both the playability and the sound. And the more I found out about the company and got to know the people, I knew that this was a company I wanted to have a relationship with. There is a drive for excellence in design and production of every instrument, not just the high-end products. And the proof of this is that the one and only Doc Severinsen helped to design the Eastman beginner trumpet model. I still play that B-flat and have added a spectacular cornet and flugelhorn to my arsenal. You can find out more at eastmanwens.com. I'd love it if you'd visit the Studio HFL website and sign up for the weekly newsletter. And while you're there, you can also visit the merch page and buy a Studio HFL shirt for yourself and as a gift for someone else. Of course, you can do that at studiohfl.com. My current situation with my C trumpet is a bit ridiculous. My Shire C, which Samantha Lane helped me trial and choose, is the most versatile C I've ever played. The same goes for the new Destino designed by Doc. This horn sizzles when I need it to sizzle and is as smooth as silk when I wear my sil- uh, never mind. Uh, anyway, the line of Shire's trumpets includes the Q series, which are production models, and the custom series. Either way you go, you'll love the sound you get, and you'll also experience exceptional customer service. Find out more at seshires.com. Here's how you can access exclusive content like the interview excerpts. I'd like to invite you to become a part of the Studio HFL community by going to Patreon and choosing from one of the four tiers of support. You can help to financially support the show for as little as $36 a year. That's only $3 a month. Benefits include exclusive access to interview excerpts, a behind-the-scenes report, an invitation to be in the room with a guest during an interview, product discounts, and more. You can join the community of faithful supporters by visiting patreon.com slash studio HFL. And now, on with the interview. How you doing, old friend? Long time. I was just trying to to think the last time I saw you. I mean, of course, I remember being at Butler and and in your your film class, and I know I've seen you a few times since then. But um, no, I think the restraining order has done its job and kept me away from you. <laughs> so, now it's it's been it's been at least uh, well fifteen twenty years. Yeah. I mean, I, I did you do some work with Jose Valencia? Uh huh. And. Uh, Orchestra Project wasn't that the name of that group? Yeah, yeah. Were you in that? Were you in that group? I I did a little bit of work. That was maybe the early two thousands. So maybe you know could have been around there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you guys, you played in the in the the uh, Duck Pen Alley, the bowling alley place. I I was not part of a okay. that group. Okay. But, yeah, he's yeah. done he's done a couple of my pieces back when he had his his little group and yeah yeah. 
Yeah, I missed that. You know, that was a he had a really good thing going with that. I mean, he he said, did, and and I, you know, I went expecting not much. Just you know, he's a good friend. Like, good for him. You know, I'll go support him. And in the middle of the performance, I'm like, crap. This is they're doing really, really well. And I think for peanuts, if not completely pro bono, it was pretty, pretty terrific. Yeah, we did. We played for free, but you know, it was one of those things where. It was a pretty tight knit group. We all knew each other. We, either we'd all gone to school together, or we've all been working right. in the regional orchestras together. And right. yeah. you know, so yeah, right. it was. Uh, I don't. I think we would all yearn for even that right now. Oh, you know, no. not not. Yeah. I, the last live performance I went to was early March. I had a piece done at IU. They commissioned a piece for their new music ensemble, and and. Went down to Bloomington, um, spent the day with the composers and then the rehearsals. And that's when they were just starting to talk about, well, you know, keep a little distance and maybe don't hug. And I was hugging everybody, David Zubay. <laughs> I love all those guys. And then the next week is when everything shut down. So yeah. that was my last live performance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I've done a couple of things, uh, a couple of regional orchestras have done some early recordings of Christmas programs, you know, and they're going to stream them later this month, but yeah. uh, you know, that's, it's still not, still not the same. It's okay, but it's not the same. Some, apparently some orchestras in the U S are doing things um, there, but ISO, ICO, definitely not. They're gone for the whole year. I had a huge, uh, I think one of my most important pieces scheduled for the ICO uh, two weeks ago. And um, my, my big World War II anniversary piece. Oh, yeah. For my dad, who was in the Pacific Theater. Um, and at the last minute, they just pulled the concert. And that was, that was but you know, yeah. everybody's in the mess. So we can't claim victimization, right? Right. <laughs> like, right. oh, woe is me. Well, woe is everybody. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And what do they see? Just as a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, that, that, ebbing tide uh sinks everybody too right <laughs> so. that's really true when, so, when 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 were you a butler remind me the years i'm glad you said years because that's true uh <laughs> i started there in 2003 started my master's 2003 and, uh, master's okay and i was there for two years then i took five years whatever it was i came back in 2000 and did a just in time to to finish my degree Ah, so, okay. Okay. and I think it was that 94, 95 time when uh, I was part of your film music class. Yeah, and one of my first times doing this, doing the class. Oh, you're kidding. No, I never would have known. It was, it was, it was a fabulous class, but you know, oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. It was, a, it was the prototype mid nineties. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. We were the guinea pigs for that. Then. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm glad I survived that. But, you know, my uh, my five or six year old son came with me to a class or two. And I remember it kind of put the kibosh on something you were going to teach that day. You're like, well, well I get it. <laughs> Do you remember that? I totally remember that. I, no, I totally remember that. I was like, whoops, well, I can't show that clip right yeah now. and i felt horrible because you know <laughs> no, well, no, 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 no. oh uh, that's funny what a great memory <laughs> yeah but nick is now 31 with a four-year-old daughter and Good lord i'm a grandpa right oh my god congrats yeah. i just became grandpa in july oh congratulations fantastic yeah yeah boy or girl yeah. a girl in connecticut so we haven't met her yet we do so oh gosh yeah where's your where's your kids uh, they are down in Greenwood, just oh, on the perfect. south side. So you can you can see them. a little bit. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're well, hoping in the spring we'll go out to Connecticut and meet her. But thank God for Zoom. Thank God for this man. Right, we right. I mean, times a week. Yeah, it's a lifesaver in many ways. It's a lifesaver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, that's um, a riot. I totally remember. There are very few things I remember. <laughs> as i get older but that i totally i can i can just close my eyes and see that uh, well there goes those two things i can't yeah <laughs> well do you do you even recall what they were what the clips would have uh, been I'm, it, it, I, I'm sure um 
there were there are three or four things in that class that are a little racy. It wouldn't have been horror stuff because there's most of the horror stuff I show is kind of corny, 1950s, you know, right. cornball right. stuff. Uh, but there are some racy things with John Barry uh, and a couple of other guys that um, that uh, you know I, I asked the class first. You know, you know, this is a little R-rated and. And you're all grown up, so you're okay with this. And every yeah. once in a while, there's there's a girl that says, "I need to excuse myself from the class," and then come, and that's fine. Um, so probably one of those one of those things. So there's a, there's a, a couple of Tom Newman uh, Thomas Newman excerpts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that involve a little bit of skin, but the music is just so gorgeous. I like to do it. And usually the guys are like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, I'll wear my trench coat next time I take that class, right? It's like, <laughs> so, um, doctor, professor, I mean, what, I'm trying to think the right way to address you or, or, or uh, you know, hey, you, I mean, but. <laughs> Mike. 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 Um, okay, so let me, let me start with this. How long have you been at Butler? Uh, 135 years. Wow, you were there in the founding, right? You were there yeah, the, the groundbreaking so ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> um, I arrived in 1980. Uh, Larry, uh, I had um, I just uh, I was ABD, um, everything but dissertation, all done, and so I was on the job market in '79, uh, and I had three interviews. Luckily, mm -hmm. um, in the era where it was still okay to be a straight white man to get a job. <laughs> but anyhow, I'm not saying that. Uh, and I had two offers. One was Butler, and the other one was University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, uh, which is a huge music program, but it's a big really? state school. Um, and while I was there in the interview, I thought, I, I, I can't understand these people. The accents were driving me oh crazy. Gosh. I mean, Indiana was south enough for me. Um, but yeah, yeah. And so I, the Butler was perfect. It was perfect. And Dick Osborne was there. And I mean, just great, great people. So, well, I'm grateful that you got the job there, or, or we would have never crossed paths. So. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am. So, I've, I've had some offers uh, since, but I always come back. I go in the interviews and come back and go, no, I love this place. And I can wow. do whatever I want. I'm the head of the composition program. I can do it however I want. So I stay put. Uh, you said Indiana was uh, south enough for you. Does, yeah. that, does that mean you came from uh, either Michigan or are we talking Maine? or Canada? <laughs> I grew up, I was born in Philly. I grew up in Northern New Jersey. My dad. Ah, okay. Um, uh, my doctor was from University of Minnesota. So yeah, that was pretty North. Um, but yeah, I'm basically <laughs> a North Jersey kid. I still drive fast. I still yell at people. And <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see if I can pick up on any kind of East Coast accent no, in there. No, it's been, it's been filtered out between Minnesota and Indiana. Um, and everything that people see on the Jersey Shore program, I never knew one person that acted or spoke like that. It really? It really made me angry. This is not the New Jersey. It was a beautiful, beautiful state with good people. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I'm from Kentucky, and I had a little ah. bit of a twang when I came north, but it disappeared very quickly. Ah, no, you have like the perfect radio enunciation. Like Why, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I'll tell you this. Uh, many times I've had people say, you know, you sound like Tom Hanks. And, yeah, yeah. and, I, and I listen back and I'm like, I don't get it. I, you know, I, I can't hear it myself. But, you know, maybe if, if Tom ever needs some voiceover work, then I might you know, put my hat in the ring and see if I can do that. And you and you don't look unlike him. I've got that a few times too. Yeah. And you're just your body language, just the way you move around is not dissimilar. So well, yeah. there's no crying in baseball. That's that's my favorite Tom Hanks line. Right. <laughs> that is that is a great line. That yeah. and Wilson, Wilson. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, oh. I just saw, I hadn't seen it for years, Forrest Gump. That, what a masterpiece. What, what a masterpiece that he is and that movie is. Well, and yes, and even, I mean, wasn't that right at the edge of some CG 
uh, or some special effects that uh, yeah you know, they were 20 it? years old and they were putting them in meetings with jfk and with lbj yeah pretty remarkable right. yeah. that's very cool yeah. um so okay i i, I want to get the real background the real scoop yeah, on yeah, you yeah. is like what uh, what did you start? Were you a vocalist, piano player, guitar? What what were you? How'd you get into music to begin with? <laughs> um, okay, I got to tell you, it's a really cute story. I'll keep it as short as I can. See this piano right here? Yeah. It's a beat up old upright. Now in the other room in our studio, we've got a big concert Steinway and another grand piano. But this is this is what I still do my writing on this beat up old wow. instrument that my dad purchased for my mom when she was pregnant with me. And she didn't want uh, ice cream and all that kind of stuff. She wanted a piano and take piano lessons. Wow. And she kept hammering and finally my dad said, okay, we'll go get you a piano. And she took piano lessons until like a couple of weeks before I was born. And her teacher said, Claire, I think, you know, why don't you take a little break? No, no, I want to keep practicing. <laughs> After I was born, she never played again until she was like a senior citizen. Oh, wow. That's, I, that's my favorite story of my life. Uh, and I'm so glad that I have this instrument. It's all out of tune. Uh, the piano technician says there's really nothing we can do, but that's fine with me. It, if it sounds okay on here, it's going to sound great on a real piano. Um, so yeah, that that's really, I believe, how it started. Uh, there were four kids in my family. She tried piano lessons with all four of us. And somehow she knew it was sticking with me differently than the others. Um, I gave a piano recital on the night of Kennedy's assassination. And my mom told me much later that the way you were able to concentrate, even though you were a kid, you were still, what, 12, 13, uh, 63, 60, I can't remember. It was 60, 62, 63. 60 yeah, okay, so I was 12 or 13 years old, and she said the way you were able to concentrate and play at the recital was pretty remarkable, and it shows that the music's in your heart. Um, shortly after that, I broke her heart and said, I want to play rock and roll. I got guitars, I got banjos, you know, the Beatles were hitting the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, I'm like, whoa. But then, in college, as a theater major and a philosophy major, uh, I took a girlfriend a date to the Philadelphia Orchestra. I was at Villanova for my undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, I took a date to the Philadelphia Orchestra to impress her how kind of cool and sophisticated I was. And the first piece on the program, I, have no, I can't remember what it is. I probably could research it, uh, but it was, it was kind of a, a weird piece, I thought. And then at the end, this little old man got out of the audience and went up on stage and hugged Eugene Ormandy. And I thought, wait a minute, that guy wrote that piece. That's how ignorant and naive I was. All I knew was Chopin, Beethoven, you know, piano music. Uh, and I thought, that's pretty cool, that guy wrote that piece. Then the next piece they played was something I had never heard of, a composer I never heard of, called La Mer, Debussy. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Intermission happens, we come back in, right of spring. Oh my God. That was it. So I think at this point, I'm about a sophomore or a junior in college. Well, hang on. Before you, before you go any further, uh, was, was your date impressed by the, the choice of concert or yeah. was that it? She, she was impressed with the mink that she was wearing. <laughs> I was not. I've been an animal lover my whole life, <laughs> right? animal rights activist. Yeah. Um, but after Rite of Spring, I had nothing to say to her. I was just, I was just paralyzed <laughs> by what this had done to me. And okay, little detour. Uh, my students know this story. Um, a week later, I felt bad that I had dissed her and ignored her because I was so wrapped up in this, this new world that I was suddenly ex uh, experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, she gave me another chance and we went to the Philadelphia Zoo that next week. And I can see this as clear as bringing your kid into the film music mm -hmm. lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we walked past the snow leopard cage, she said, wow, I'd love a coat out of that. And that was our <laughs> last day. So yeah, it was the right of spring and I'm not the only one. I'm sure you've met many, many, many composers who say that was the piece that did it. Uh, I, I never stopped um, Jimi Hendrix or the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, 
But man, Stravinsky suddenly became the number one guy. And through that, uh, between him and Zappa, I started discovering all the people that turned out I would love for a lifetime, Verez and Stockhausen and Bartok and Ives. And, and uh, you know, Zappa said they were cool, so they must be cool. And then through Stravinsky and all that. So, so as soon as I finished Villanova, I said, this is what I want to do. Uh-huh. I was writing music at Villanova for the graduate mm-hmm. theater department. I was doing incidental music for some plays. I'm sure it was absolutely horrible, but I was, you know, kind of, coming in the back door of, of, of figuring out what composing was all about. So I was pretty green and pretty older when this all started. But you know, you say green, but doesn't everybody start there? I mean, your first yeah, pieces are, yeah, are, are yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they make good things to roll up and light the candles with, right? Like the old Bach right. the stories about the Bach manuscripts. Um, right. right. Yeah, and this is all freehand. I mean, we're talking a decade or two before any kind of uh, finale or Sibelius came oh, around. I mean, this uh, was all handwritten manuscript that you were working there. Absolutely. See, um, that's yeah. that. Yeah, that is something that amazes me uh, with composers is how you have to take the time to do that. I mean, it was time consuming, right? Incredibly time consuming. You had to have a hundred and ten percent commitment to knowing what you that you wanted to do this. I remember working on my on my master's thesis at heart, Larry, uh, it was a big orchestra piece and there would be numerous times on pages, I'd make a mistake with the ink after three or four hours of doing it and I'd have to crumple it up and oh, throw no. it away and start the page all over again. But you go, well, this is what you do. And, and back in those days, <laughs> it sounded like Walter Brennan, wow, back. Uh, yeah. We were so happy that we had a special kind of paper that had been developed in the 70s that was so much easier to work with than the manuscript paper from the 40s and the 50s. So we thought we were, you know, high tech as it could be. Was, was it special just because it because it cost more? I mean, is that how uh, it cost a little more? It 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 reproduced much clearer oh. than earlier papers. They were called vellum onion skins. They were transparent, and actually the staves were written uh, were, were engraved uh, on the other side of the page, so you could still see them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. Very strange. If you made a mistake, uh, if you made a small mistake, there were little. India ink erasers that you could work at. It never worked perfectly. Uh, my go-to technique, as many of my colleagues, was to actually cut out the wrong note with a razor blade, tape a little piece of manuscript paper underneath it, and then write in the right note. I've and never I heard of that. It's, it's, it sounds like the dark ages, man. So whenever any of my students complain about, oh, finale, this is so bad, I go, you know, I'm sorry, you guys, I don't, I don't need to hear about it. You know, I took another, uh, I took an orchestration class. Um, I, I tried a year of my doctorate at Ball State. And, oh. uh, and so I'd already been familiar with finale and Sibelius both, but uh, the guy that was teaching the class, you know, as we're orchestrating, I, he said, you know, you can't use any programs, you have to freehand it. Who was a teacher? Uh, Derek. Oh, he was, he's a, a guitar player. He teaches, I think he got his degree down at IU. I can't remember his last name. Okay. Terrific, terrific teacher for that class though, young. Um, but uh, so, you know, I was forced to, to do that. But I remember studying, it might've been Elliot Carter. There was somebody in that, that era whose manuscript looked, it was the most pristine. It was the most beautiful. Right. And, and I, if it was him or not, but I'm thinking, how did somebody do this by hand? And, you know, I guess there were tools, right? Certain kinds of tools that you could use for spacing and, and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. so did, did you hang on to any of that early work that you did? Do you have, oh, all I still of it? have all that stuff yeah. and, and, uh, all that stuff's published by, uh, MMB, which is now Hal Leonard, unfortunately. Um, but, it's it's still in my hand manuscript. A lot of those pieces there, and you know, if you if you get some Barber pieces or Copeland pieces, they're going to sell them no matter what, so they don't bother putting them in finale. But but the copyists that Barber and Copeland, those guys would use, were that that was their job. That's all they did. So if you look at those handwritten Barber Copeland scores, you have to look with them. Micro, uh, a magnifying glass 
to notice, oh my God, that treble clef is just a little bit different than that other treble clef. And you go, my God, this is, this is hand manuscript. Yeah. But that was their job. Those, they were yeah. professional copyists. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, okay. I'm thinking back to that first concert. You said, you know, La Mer on one half and Rite of Spring on the other. I mean, one of the most sublime pieces that WC, I mean, it's just lush and gorgeous. And, yeah. Yeah. and, and then Stravinsky. There's, they're both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. But, and to think that you were impressed by both, because in my mind, you are the, the Stravinsky, Zappa, uh, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, that's, and the music that I played of yours, I think reflects a lot of that influence. But um, did you find that you uh, were still attracted to Debussy and Ravel? Maybe some of those, those composers? That's a great question. Uh, I think, uh, and I've thought of this a few times, if the, if the order had been reversed that night at the Philadelphia Orchestra, mm -hmm. I think I would have found La Mer wanting a lot. Uh, I think what impressed me, uh, Larry, was that I had never heard an, a later orchestra piece that sounded so lush and, mm -hmm. and you couldn't find the pulse and these rich harmonies that I had heard from jazz, but not in classical music. That's how naive I was. Um, but yeah, I think if the order was reversed, I'd be like, ah, oh, this, is, this, is, this is boring compared to Stravinsky. But you're yeah. right, I'm still not a WC fan. A few pieces, it's like, they're okay. And I use a few for in teaching certain things about impressionism and modality and stuff but mm -hmm. yeah you're absolutely right it's not not my cup of tea mm -hmm. so, uh early on what kind of uh ensembles the well, two-part question really is like what kind of ensembles and then well, what styles of music were you were you writing for those groups uh you mean my own pieces what kind of ensemble yeah yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I've always stayed away from traditional pairings. String quartet, wind quintet, wind quartet, woodwind quintet, brass. I, I, I thought a couple of things. One, I'm not that interested in it. There's so many great pieces that are already done, including pieces written, you know, yesterday that are great. Uh, I've always loved mixing heterogeneous eclectic groups. Uh, I just did a chamber piece last year that has three accordions, a double bass, a piano, two percussionists, a violin, and a tenor saxophone. I love that kind of, let's see, you know, what we can do, like a little kid in a candy store. Um, I, as a matter of fact, my miniature bio on my website for years was he grew up in New Jersey and has never written a string quartet. And I was really proud of that bio until about 10 years ago, Larry, I got a commission from a string quartet in Phoenix. And I'm like, oh. okay, I'll do it. So now it says, grew up in New Jersey and it has never written a woodwind quintet. That's oh, it. there you go. Yep. yep. Now, see, it, it, just because you say string quartet, you could have said, okay, I'm going to write it for four basses or four, four violas, right? I mean, it's still yeah, a string I, quartet. And I love that kind of stuff. Tradition, we're talking about tradition. Yeah, I know. I... Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that. I've got a good friend in Japan. He wrote a piece for nine double basses and solo double bass. And it's like, it's incredible, incredible sound. Yeah, I, I always love that. And I, I kind of credit my teacher at heart with that, who would say with his big, thick German accent, his big bald head, Mike, you know, you need to try different combinations. And that was new to me, but man, I fell in love with those different combinations. Isn't it fun to see what's going on these days, though? I mean, you get on YouTube and you see, uh, well, uh, uh, Mark Ortwine, you know, he's got his sure. bassoon quartet or octet, whatever it is, yeah. but you see yeah. uh, bass clarinet octets and uh, people are mixing, mixing it up and some yeah. really cool sounds, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you were writing for, let's, uh, hang on. I, my mind's trying to go three different directions. Oh. Um, Bless your heart. <laughs> uh, well, I, but I, there's so much I want to know. Uh, well, you, I tell you what, you lead me on. You've, you've gone to heart. Now, what, what uh, takes place after that? Where were you headed? What were you doing after heart? Um, I, I, I stayed one extra year at heart and started my doctorate there. Um, I had been there for uh, three years as a man. I had a TA, so I kind of stretched it out a little bit. 
uh, and, and I loved New England. So I just thought to stay there. You're, you know, an hour from New York, an hour and a half from Boston. It was really perfect. Um, I didn't have any kids yet, so it was fine. Uh, and, and I started the doctor program because I loved my teacher. I adored my teacher, mm -hmm. Arnaldo Franchetti, who was a student of Richard Strauss for five years. So I just sucked in all the orchestration. Any, any decent orchestration I have in my pieces, I credit to studying with Franchetti. Mm -hmm who sucked it all in from, from, from Strauss. Uh, Franchetti was also friends with Puccini, you know? And when he was growing up in, in Italy, his dad, who was a composer, his buddy Verdi used to come to the house all the time for dinner. So it's like, you know, it's pretty mind boggling. One day Franchetti said to me, you know, you know, Copeland helped me come to America after World War II. Franchetti fought in the anti-Mussolini uh, Italian underground, <laughs> it survived. Wow. Uh, when he came to these shores in uh, early 46, Copeland picked him up at Ellis Island, got him a house and said, you're a great composer, I wanna help you. So he'd say in his lessons, um, you know, someday we will, I will take you to see him. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Well, he kept saying it never happened. And I thought it was just, you know, he's blowing smoke. One day, 6 a.m. at my apartment, Mike, come pick me up. We go to see Copeland today. <laughs> so that's how I hooked up with Copeland. And then I, I went on my own number. Well, what, what was that like, that, that initial he meeting? A, he had already stopped composing, Larry. Uh, he was really in conducting at that point, mm -hmm. uh, making a lot of recordings of his music, but other music. He was just a sweet mm -hmm. grandfather. Uh, the second time, the, the next time I went just by myself without Franchetti, uh, he said, Mike, I have, try these. And he handed me a, a, a bag of Milano cookies, Pepper's Farm. They were new, I guess. Yeah, I had yeah. never seen them. I'm like, wow. And we sat and ate Pepper's Farm Milano cookies. He was also the first gay person I really knew. Uh, it's pretty, back in the 70s, things yeah. were not quite right. as open as they are now. Right. Um, uh, he, he, he never, I wasn't that bad looking, let's say, in the 70s. Very long blonde hair, very thin. Um, and I knew he liked me, but he didn't like me in that way. And there was never anything. And he knew I was married. Uh, and, and we would just go in his studio and he'd look at my music uh, and make a few comments. Not, not much. Just being around him was an inspiration rather than the things he was saying. Right. Yeah. And I was a huge, I loved Appalachian Spring, but I was really a huge fan of his later stuff, his much thornier stuff and his very early stuff. He's got from his, from when he was in his twenties, he's got a piano concerto, an organ concerto. These things are just in your face, dissonant and jazzy. Uh, my least favorite era of his personally is the Americana stuff. But of course, that's what, that's what the world loves. And that's, it, right. it's, it's good that he'll be remembered because of those things, because then young students will say, oh my God, did you realize he did this too? Or this uh, orchestra piece that's in 12 tone and you know, so forth and so on. So it was, it was a real treat just being around him. I just, uh, it was the most famous guy I had ever met. And I was like, <laughs> what, I hope I say the right thing. You know, I was yeah. Really, nervous yeah i you know i just i can't well i can't imagine i mean i've i've been able to talk to some really uh, unbelievably famous in my in my you know doc severinson was kind of the big whoa the big, oh, you know and, and and we've become friends which is really kind of cool i mean i wow. I, I, I could text him right now if i wanted to or call him wow, but, that's yeah, he's, he's still in good shape from what i understand right he's still 93 playing. years old Incredible. still practices every day and Incredible. goes to the gym three days a week and yeah wow how cool is that that's wonderful it's, larry that's yeah cool. so but you know it's and i get what you're talking about about uh maybe not studying directly with somebody but just being in somebody's presence you do you you pick up on on what makes them special and I, yeah, and so, you know, I, I'm thinking, holy cow, well, of course, we're all influenced by everything we see and hear, you know, to different degrees, but, you know, I'm thinking, how much Copeland would I hear if I really went and studied your works? You know, I'm sure I would hear bits of 
Rite of Spring or yeah. oh, no? No Copeland. no Copeland. No Copeland. One piece, one piece, the piece I wrote with him, an orchestra piece, which was called El Salon Medico. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and he's like, Mike. And I go, no, 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 it's, it's dedicated to my brother who had just finished medical school. Um, and he had always been a big supporter. To this day, he says, you know, I keep them alive, but you give them a reason to stay alive. And uh, it's, it's wow. beautiful, it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, I, it's a little six minute orchestra piece and it still gets performed. I'll, I'll get a message from some conductor. I go, no, 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 here, play this one. No, we want to do El Salon Medico. I'm like, oh my God, it's total rip off. There's not one original note in there. Um, uh, <laughs> Old composer, you may have heard of David Stock, who passed away about 10 years ago, a dear friend from uh, Pittsburgh. Um, he called me up one day and said, uh, Shelly, I just, I just turned off the radio. I, I was driving and I heard this Copeland piece that I've never heard before. And I thought, I know everything Copeland wrote, but I've never heard this. And then it turned out to be your piece with the Minnesota Orchestra. And oh, that's funny. And there's not one original note in there, but it's really good. And I thought, good, that's good. I'll take that. So yeah, I got it out of my system really fast. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So it keep, let's keep going down the road. What's, what's coming oh, next? Um, Oh, so after uh, after I decided uh, I'd had enough with Frank Caddy three years, nothing against him. I just wanted to, to try someplace else. I applied to a bunch of doctorate programs, see, see what my luck would hold. Um, I got in everywhere except my safety school. Well, I'll apply to Ohio State because everybody gets in there. I got rejected flatly from Ohio State. I got a full ride at Eastman. I got a full ride at Minnesota. And I picked Minnesota because of the teachers. At that point, it was Argento and Eric Stokes, uh, who was kind of a Charles Ivesian kind of composer, mm -hmm. and a man named Paul Fettler, who just passed away at about 100 years old, who had been a student at Yale. Uh, he was Latvian, but he'd come to this country uh, and studied at Yale with Hindemith, and Boris Blocker, and I was a huge Boris Blocker fan. I thought, man, I, I so I went for the teachers. Um, I was told by friends, close friends on the East Coast, you're committing professional suicide if you go to Minnesota and don't go to Eastman. And I thought, well, I'll take my chances. I, I met Samuel Adler. I, I respect his music. I didn't like him as a person. I felt uncomfortable at Eastman. The weather was miserable. Uh, Wait, the... Minnesota's going to be any better? I don't know. But Minnesota had blue skies when it's not okay. snowing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's just I, I just had a bad vibe and Minnesota, I'd never been that far west or that far north and I thought, I love this city and St. Paul is cool and the Minnesota Orchestra and the Guthrie Theater and Dennis Russell Davies at the and Bill McLaughlin at the at the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. This is heaven and it's all self contained. Everything's within 45 minutes because there's nothing else within right. four to five hours, right? So everything had to be right there. It was really a golden age. Um, you know, the composer, Steve Paulus, have you come across? Yes, this? yes. Yeah. So he was my buddy in my doctor program, him and Libby Larson, the three of us were there at the same time. Yeah. Uh, very close, hung out all the time, pizza, beer all the time. Uh, I still miss Steve. That's one of the big tragedies that he mm. passed away. Uh, so young, such an incredible composer. So yeah, it was a pretty, uh, Minnesota Composers Forum started while I was there, which eventually became the American Composers Forum. It was the hotbed of new music. So I, I made a good choice. Yeah. You know, I, I've never thought about this until just now. And I, you know, I can imagine, because I've done it, going through bachelor's and trumpet, well, music ed, but then a, a master's in trumpet, and, and then, you know, going into a doctorate in trumpet. And I know the progression, you know, yes, you're looking for teachers, especially at the master's and doctorate level, teachers that you, you meld with. But I'm thinking about, it, to me, there's a logical progression. Okay, if I'm going to go to my master's, what am I going to focus on now? Now, if I'm going to go to my doctorate, what am I going to focus on now? What does that look like for a composer? I mean, you, you know, how, what, what does a master's give you? What does a doctorate give you? Or is it simply studying with those people at that time? 
That's uh, a good question. And I think, I think if you had asked me back uh, when I was naive and ignorant enough to not know the answer, I'd say, well, I'd just like to do it. And I think these teachers are cool without thinking of the future or, or without thinking about the practical, the reality mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to learn everything I could and I just wanted to write music all the time. Um, it's different now and how I advise my students is still for me still i'm old school the bottom line is if if you if you love doing this and you want to do this before anything else then just do it you'll find a way the world will find a way to absorb you and support you there's always room for another good one in my opinion, or another hardworking good one, especially. Mm -hmm. um, so I was pretty naive, but I thought, I, I love university life. I'd like to be a teacher. And mm -hmm. after being around Frank Caddy and then my teachers at Minnesota, and even my, my theater professors at Villanova, these guys are the coolest thing. I thought, this is a great life, you know? You just work with young people and, and share ideas. So I kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. And in order to do that, you had to be certified with an, a, a terminal degree. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn that much more in my doctorate degree, but I got a lot more experience. Yeah. But uh, the way I was when I finished my master's is pretty much the same way I was when I finished my doctorate. But you need that certification. Um, you need that official degree. Uh, so I, I thought I'll pursue it, but I'm going to be in a place that I really enjoy while I'm doing this thing. And that's mm -hmm. the other reason I picked Minnesota. I, my, one of my best friends in the world, Elliot Schwartz, who was like my big brother, he said, well, you'll probably get a job in the Midwest. Well, he was right. <laughs> but I'm glad. You know, I, my kids live on the East Coast. My son lives in New York. My daughter lives in Connecticut. And I love going to visit them. And I love seeing where I grew up and New York City was my town but man after four or five days I'm ready to leave and it's probably partially my age but uh, yeah yeah I'm, well I, th it, I think you're a little too laid back for Manhattan you know I, I think so I think so I think you're right I, yeah. and I'm, I'm a little maybe a little too gentle yeah. yeah one of the first pieces I remember playing was uh, was with Butler Symphony Orchestra and Stan Darusha had programmed I, I can't remember the name, but it, it honored uh, Indiana uh, figures like uh, it was James Dean. Oh, yeah. Uh, Spirits. Spirits. Was Spirits. Piece. Yeah. How many movements were that? Were there in that? Stan, man, Stan. Um, uh, six movements. Six. Yeah, six infamous Hoosiers. Um, that was a fun piece. That was, uh, it's like composer dream come true number one. I was just sitting around uh, doing something and the phone rang and said, we'd like to commission a piece from you that 30 orchestras will play and we'll pay you a lot of money. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is a crack call. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a dream come true. Every orchestra in the state and then eventually many other states played it. The one orchestra that refused to do it because it was too weird. Wanna take a guess? Oh, ISO. Name begins with Raymond. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, That's... yeah. I said I actually have I still have the letter. Um, it's one of my pride and joys. This is not the kind of music the Indianapolis Symphony programs. And I thought, you know, you're right. <laughs> but everybody else did, including Cleveland Orchestra, Milwaukee Symphony, and then a bunch of orchestras in Indiana. And, and yeah, Stan did it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you attend as many of those as you can? Those when those orchestras play those, do you try to make it? This, it's going to sound a little snobby. If it's a really big orchestra, I do like to go because the in the in person experience of a really good orchestra. Uh, Detroit's done a couple over the last couple of years. Dayton, uh, I, I do go, and it's close enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, did you ever get to relive? You're talking about that first date where you saw the guy get up out of the audience, go to the stage. Have you ever been that guy now that when the piece is over, they've asked you to stand and come to the stage, and you're recognized? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do that. I don't like to give pre-concert talks. A lot of composers do love to get up there. Well, my inspiration was, you know, the the intersection of the whatever. And, and no, I don't just just listen to the music, but I'm happy to go up and, you know, shake the I usually give a big hug to the conductor. Um, I had a, an opera done in Poland last year and and I jumped to the stage when it was over and hugged 
it's it's my Al Capone opera. And the guy that did Al Capone, I hugged him so tight. I, I couldn't stop embracing him. And I know the audience was screaming and yelling. They loved that. But I was just, I, I just, what he had done with the piece was was amazing to me. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I, I became that guy. So my dream came true, basically. I worked really hard to have it happen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you're right. And I wonder, that's a really good point. I wonder who's in the audience that sees me do that and thinks, wow, that's cool. I'd like to do that. I right? thought of it that way. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I won't even charge you for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my so, check mark here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So one of the things that, of course, fascinated me about you was uh, while I was at Butler, I had the opportunity to take this a course on film music and I'm in there and it might have been it might still be the coolest class I've ever taken oh thanks man well no truly because I, I mean just well first of all the personality at the front of the room it's you I mean <laughs> you, you make things fun Thank you, you know and and you presented things in a in a, a really fun way but not fun at the expense of learning and not learning something, right. right? Right, right. And so I'm thinking, all right, 20 some years after I've taken that class, I still don't go to a movie or watch a movie at home and not think something about the soundtrack I've just listened to or wait until the credits. You know, you have to wait and see who did the score this time. Right. And then you and then you start guessing, right? I remember Jenny and I were taking, all right, you, you think it's a... Uh, Thomas Newman or Randy Newman? Oh, I don't know. I think it's probably uh, James Horner or some, you know, but yeah, you've that really, it, and I think that's what classes of any kind are supposed to do is to open your mind and yeah. get you thinking about. Uh, that's and so that's, that's, so thank you for, you know, even if we were the guinea pigs in that class, I'm glad we were the guinea pigs and uh, you're still teaching that class. Yeah, if I think of back the generation that you did it, I probably walked into class every night with a giant box of VHS videotapes. <laughs> yeah. And they were all cued to the exact scene. And then I'd have to go home that night and re-cue them for the next year. Now, half of the stuff I use is on YouTube. And, oh. and uh, years ago, I took all my VHS tapes uh, that I had recorded myself, mostly from TCM. Uh, and switch them over to DVR, DVD-R. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so half YouTube and then a small little package of, uh, of DVRs that I bring. Mm. It's a little easier. Although I think I'm going to offer the class this summer. Uh, it may or may not go. If it doesn't go, that's fine. And then that'll mm -hmm. be it. I'm not going to do it again. It's It's been a, a, a blast and a fun ride to have students like you mm. in there. Uh, yeah, I've been accused with a wink of the eye. You know, you've ruined the movie going experience for me forever because all I do is listen to the music. I can't pay attention to the plot. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about you as a film composer, or I think, didn't you even say you had, uh, you used a non de plume sort of as, uh, didn't you work under a different name? Uh, while I was working on the book, which I think came out after you had taken the class, yep. you took it in the midnight, the book came out in 99. And actually it was because of that class, the, um, that I had done in a couple of years, the, the publisher in LA knew about me and said, we'd like you to write this book because you're a concert guy who really appreciates uh, and embraces film music, but you're not in it for any political reasons. If we, if we hire a film composer to do this, it's gonna be all political and no. you're gonna be looking for a gig. You're not looking for a gig. So yeah, yeah, I jumped at that opportunity and I interviewed, I think it was a dozen or I can't remember how many composers, really in-depth interviews. Um, I had everybody that I wanted, except Jerry Goldsmith, never mm -hmm. able to uh, track him down through his management, and we had to go to print. Um, where was I going with this? Uh, oh, yeah. So during the course of, of interviewing, I'd go to L.A. many times to interview these guys. Uh, and I'm thrilled because now everything is done over Zoom. I had to go to L.A. and go to Elmer Bernstein's house and go to Mark Shaman's house and go to Mark Isham's house, the trumpet guy, right? 
Uh, it was a blast. Mark Isham's a Scientologist, and in his house are pictures of of, uh, of um, L. Ron Hubbard everywhere. I mean, it's just great. Just really. Yeah. Um, so yeah, during that time, a couple of the guys I got to know, uh, kind of second tier film composers, like, hey man, you know, if you're coming back next month, you know, I could really use some help with this picture. You want to help? Uh, there are a couple of pictures where I got handed. Uh, multiple thousand dollars in cash and my name's not on it anywhere and I thought this I'm is gonna I'll, let, I'll edit that out for you you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah one of them said it comes from a Colombian drug cartel that's where the funding was coming from I don't wow. know I don't know anything about anything it was just fun and I was just like a little kid you know I don't need the credit that's fine uh but it, that that lasted very briefly um a couple of years, I did maybe, I was involved in three pictures. Uh, the final, which was to be the fourth one, a picture called G-Men from Hell, starring Robert Goulet, Phyllis Diller and Soupy Sales. I mean, where, don't even, don't even. So the director who is related, blood relation to Francis Ford Coppola said, maybe edit that one out too. Um, said, I want kind of Henry Mancini, kind of dirty, you know, jazzy, Peter Gunny kind of stuff. I said, oh yeah, I got that couple of baritone saxes. We're, we're good to go. And I, I did the, uh, I did the, uh, the, the, the sample. I flew out to LA. He liked it, but he said, you know, I've decided I'm going with acoustic guitar. And he hired Leo Kotke to do the score. And I said, you know, I spent a lot of effort doing this. This is bullshit. I, you know, I, I, I want to go back to writing spirits and samurai and all the things that right. I really love, where I can be completely in charge. Megalomania, that's fine. Uh, completely in charge. I decide what goes here, what goes here. Uh, no editing, no cutting, no director saying, well, I don't like how this, it's, that's not my style. I could never have done it that way. The only guys that don't have to really follow those well I guess you're an employer you're you're not you're not the employee Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams don't have to do that they can do whatever they want Spielberg says do whatever you want I'll make it work Jerry Goldsmith could do that but most of those guys you know they're Christopher Young's one of my best friends now as a result of the interview and he says half of my best stuff ends up on the cutting room floor right. or completely rejected he got hired to do Doctor Strange, did this incredible score, orchestra and choir score. And at the last minute they said, we don't like, they threw it out and fired him. It's like, whoa, that's not for me. Uh, I had the good fortune, uh, just last month, I interviewed uh, Bruce Broughton. Wow, what a great musician. What a great guy. It, it, it was my first big Hollywood film composer. And, wow. I, and I'm, I'm reaching out to some others, you know, I haven't been able to get it. And, and my son told me about this, uh, I think she's an apprentice of Hans Zimmer, uh, Pinar Toprak, or I think. Yeah, 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 I know her. She's a Duke alum, actually. Concert oh. composer from Duke, yeah, yeah, she's terrific. So I'm trying to get a hold of a, a lot of those, but yeah, you talk about the employee-employer part of that. And Bruce was talking about that, you know? It's their movie. They're calling the shots. You know, you kind of have to, yeah. to to do what they ask for. But, you know, and hearing you talk about that, I mean, yeah, you're in it for a whole different reason, right? You didn't right. venture into film music. You were asked to, to come into that and right. that you were taken out of your element, so to speak. That right. sounds kind of base, but. No, um, it's, true. it's true. Yeah, I gave, I gave it the old college try, and and when it was all said and done, especially after G Men from Hell, I said, I, I I love I'm going back to Butler. I love working with young composers, and if they want to go into film music, that's great. I can help them, you know, get into the system because I know all these guys now. But it's not for me. Um, one of the greatest lines of the interview with Chris Young, and the thing that really bonded us also that we grew up like 10 minutes from each other in New Jersey, which we found out during the interview, which is kind mm -hmm. of cool. Um, he's the composer for like Spider-Man 3, Hellraiser, Hellbound, Drag Me to Hell, all those great horror movies. Um, he said, sometimes I envy you because you can write anything you want. 
And I said, yeah, that's true, that's true. He said, but on the other hand, if I want 12 marimbas, I can use 12 marimbas. So I thought, well, okay, so, you know, you, you, it's, right. it's, it's a give and take thing. Bruce right. Brown, man, when I interviewed him at his house, I, I walked over to his shelves. First of all, his scores are incredible. They're almost completely handwritten, fully orchestrated. Wow. Sometimes short score, like it might have three lines winds, three lines brass, three lines string, uh, but he's such the real deal. And, and those kind of guys are getting fewer and further between. Mm -hmm. It's all done with computers. And uh, I have friends that, former students actually, that work at, um, at Joy and Kane Music Services, which mm -hmm. does all the score preparation for the, the Hollywood pictures. And they say now they don't even get any scores. They just get... Uh, uh, you know, some kind of chip that they stick into the computer and they have to create the score out of the sounds they're hearing. They said one guy still delivers the complete score. Randy Newman, bless oh. his heart. <laughs> he said, everything's right there. It's almost indecipherable because his manuscript is so horrible, but it's all there, all the meter yeah. changes, all the, yeah. Yeah, cool. I, I, I remembering something you told us about Danny Elfman and about uh, him, the way he orchestrated, right? He, he didn't know how to write it down. Didn't you t say he had, like had a team of people that he would go and play something for and they would go put it on paper or? Early, early on. Yeah. He was basically a rock and roller who loved movie music. Uh, so he, he learned in the trenches with the helps of mostly people like Shirley Walker who mm -hmm. was his conductor, his orchestrator, his choreographer, his choir person. Uh, she said that he was kind of a hummer. He'd go like, da, 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 da. And he'd say, do something with that. And then she'd create the Batman score, okay? But as a result of that, he learned, he learned. And right. it, was, it was pretty quick that he started basically doing all his own stuff. But those early Batman, Edward Scissorhands, uh, he'd have a little tune. And Shirley Walker, she even showed me when I interviewed her, she showed me a score and she said, here's the uh, dark man score. This is all my handwriting. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at the same time, she'd be the first one to say he's a brilliant musician. He just needs to learn how to do this notation stuff, which yeah. eventually he did. Yeah. I, I, before I forget, uh, tell me the name of the book that you're referencing where you interviewed all these people. It's called The Score published in 1999 um and uh can i get it on amazon or where, where can yeah, i find yeah, it yeah yeah and i think one of the reasons it's still selling okay 20 years later is movies don't go out of uh, movies still exist and there are four composers in there that have passed on so i think a lot of people uh, buy the book because it's like they can see what did john barry say and what did elmer bernstein say but see that's another reason i really value being able to do these interviews is because now I have archival, right? If somebody wants to know something about Michael Shelley, right? I've got, I've got some footage that <laughs> will give them some, some sort of interesting, no, well, it gives them some interesting stuff to listen to, right? But right. I mean, that's exactly what you did was you, you had the opportunity to document these people yeah. and their contributions and their stories, right? I mean, that's, so yeah. I, I wanna get a copy of that, but I wanna, uh, okay, I wanna get okay, you. Okay, hold on. Uh, one, one second detour. I don't want to use a dirty word. I won't use the dirty word. You can, I'll, I'll edit it out. Okay, so I'm interviewing Terrence Blanchard, all right? Mm, yeah. all, the Spike, all the Spike Lee movies, okay? Incredible trumpet guy, is he a trumpet guy, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he, he did, I think his first picture was Jungle Fever. And he said, he said, Spike, I don't know how to write for orchestra. And Spike Lee said, just listen to La Mer and Rite of Spring. So I, I told him about my first concert. We laughed, we bonded like crazy. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the, he's such a, just a you know, New York jazz guy. Right. Every fourth word in the interview was the MF word. And so we get the transcript, we, we transcribe the interview. We're just dying, me and the editor and the secretary who's transcribing. So the editor taught me, he said, if we leave them all in, it dilutes everything. We have to handpick 
the five or six that we leave in for impact. And I, and I found out that day, the rule of transcribing an interview, you can delete anything you want, but you can't add even a the or an if or a anything. You can't add any of that. So we deleted about 20 MFs and left a few in for, for the impact. But he was so cute, so innocent, like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you but never know it, his scores are terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's a Samuel Jackson wannabe or fan, right? I mean, because <laughs> that's that's what he says in every movie at least a dozen times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I want to get a copy of that book and I want to have you autograph it. I think that would be a, a nice My thing. Honor. To, yeah. So My we're honor. close enough. We could we could make that happen at some point. We can but, make that happen. Um, you talk about transcribing. I now have this program where I can I can download this interview after we're done, and it will uh, it'll transcribe it for me. But it's not Whoa. even close. It's not even close to being accurate. But what I've learned, it has this feature where it will remove filler words, uh, like uh, or repeated, like like. Wow. And and I thought this is great. And I tried that on a couple of interviews and I listened back to and it immediately when you take it out of the transcript, it also edits the video. It, it's fantastic. Incredible. But you take that out and the speech pattern now is different. I mean, it's the voice of the person you're talking to. But if you know that person, which some people listening, you know, back to this will know they'll know that it's been edited. That's not their speech pattern. That's I see. because if you take out the pauses, if you take out the, all of those things, right. So I have done exactly what you're talking about. I've become a little more judicious. I leave everything in and then I select what to take out because it's, it is, it's, that's part of their speech. That's, and it has an impact one way or the other, it's going to have an impact right, on that. Right. Oh, that's wow. So, how many of these have you done, Larry? This, I think, is 147. Oh my God, I had no idea. So are you archiving these somewhere? Can just the people off the street go check these things out? Studio HFL, which started out as, okay, I, I'm, I've changed it, but originally HFL, I want you to think like a trumpet player. Huh. HFL, what, what do you think? Uh... I'll give, you, I'll give you the word higher. Higher frequency level. Higher, faster, louder. All right, it's, it's a trumpet <laughs> thing, right? Higher, faster, louder. Got so it. So that's, that's how it started, that's yeah. Fantastic. And are, uh, musicians, like uh, not just composers, you're interviewing different musicians. Uh, well, it started out as just trumpet players. So if you go to the first 50 or 60, it's trumpet. Wow. But, um, so uh, as first composers, Jim Stevenson, uh, yeah. Brian Balmages, and these are people that I know through Hal Leonard and uh, another FJH Publishing, right? They come to town and, and uh, uh, Mike, oh my gosh, forgot him, from Hal Leonard. Uh, he comes down and conducts the sessions down here. But, you know, those are the composers I've got. Uh, conductors, I, I'm trying to get some conductors. I got Matthew Kramer from the ICO. Good. Um, and this is another reason I was talking to you is, you know, I wanted, I got Henry Leck and Josh Petty, Susan Kitterman and Adam Bodoni, right? So I've got the, the, the locals because this is turning into a radio show in January. And I thought we have That's so it. much local talent that I know people are going to want to hear from. Yes, they're going to want to hear about Doc Severinsen, but, um, you know, what about Michael Shelley and, and, you know, here's somebody, right? You can never be famous in your own backyard. Since oh, we mentioned, you. I'll, I'll since leave. you mentioned spirits, I think we've got to at least include a movement of that. But you'll have to tell me. Everything's on SoundCloud. Uh, oh, terrific! Yeah, and you can access the. You can just uh, look for me on SoundCloud or on my website. There's a big fat link for just going to SoundCloud under the Great. audio page. Yeah. So if you pick whatever you want. Uh, just okay. not. Well, El Salon Medico. <laughs> like, no, but see, that that might have to be the piece that opens little, the program. In the background. Wait, isn't that isn't that isn't that Rodeo? Wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's fantastic, Larry. Uh, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. So you're going to stick mostly with local for the time being? I'm genuinely, genuinely interested in. You're in just this, using so. me. 
to get to or Christopher. No, you, you, <laughs> you would know. And you know what? I remember you brought him or Stan brought him to campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah been... I brought him. Yep. Yep. And we did and, Hellraiser on a Halloween concert. Yep. And that ended up in a CD, Larry. It ended up in a CD. Uh, he he was disappointed. Chris was disappointed that he hadn't they hadn't released his score for Judas. What was it called? Judas Kiss. Uh, not a great movie, but he loved the score. So he he paid with his own money to release the CD with Judas Judas Kiss. And then the other side, the other side of the CD was the Butler concert. I, I should be on that. Uh, you, oh, totally you're on it, yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, well, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna have to find that. So the Butler yeah. Archives, uh, right? I think if you, if you, if you uh, go to, um, it, it's, it's still in print, I'm sure, because Judas Kiss won't go out of print. But yeah, on the back there, it says Butler Symphony Orchestra, Stan DeRusha, special thanks to Mike Shelley, blah, 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 blah. It, yeah, it's great. That's pretty, oh my gosh. pretty impressive. Um, that was Eric Stark's first year at Butler. And I got him to do the choral parts for Species which is all Penderecki kind of stuff, right? It's all yeah. blisses and smears. And he was such a good sport. Like, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. When he came up for tenure, I said, I vote for him unconditionally. He stepped <laughs> up to the plate and did Species his first year. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah, 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 that was great. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me ask, um, I mean, you've, you've given me some great background, some great stories. Um, it, it doesn't have to be anything embarrassing, but is there something that stands out, you know, an, uh, an experience either in a performance or a, a composition or recording that you're like, yeah, this, and maybe it's, you know, the kind of, I forgot my pants moment, uh, but, you know, so, something along that line. And when you split your pants at the bowling alley with your- on Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there, there are a couple of, negative things that have happened, including a couple of killer reviews. I had, I had one review wow. where the, 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 um, the headline was composer lapses into disgrace, but it was so bad that I ended up framing it and it's in my wow. office, right? And it's right next to an interview. I had a piece done in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Symphony, and that critic trashed Penderecki. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to put this right here next to the guy that trash Penderecki. Um, mostly good things. I think it's because basically an optimistic guy. Uh, so the bad things, I, I, I try to let them wash over me quicker and, and hold on to the good things. Spirit's a good example. Um, I, I think it was Milwaukee. I went backstage after the concert and there were two little elderly nuns backstage with the habit and everything. Now I grew up Catholic in New Jersey. So as soon as I see them, I'm like, oh, right. That's like, you know, oh, I feel safe. One of them came up to me crying, hugging. And she said that Jim Jones movement changed my life. And I'm like, I'm, I, I get the chills. I was, I was, I was, I was sweating. I, it, it, it changed my life that I had affected her. She said, I said, I said, wow, a lot of people really have trouble with that movement because it conjures up the stuff and it's, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a really aggressive movement. She said, she said something I've never forgotten. She said, no, no, it was beautiful. She said, the crucifixion isn't pretty but it's beautiful. And I thought, oh my God, I'm getting the chills just saying, you know, I'm not a big religious guy, but coming from a little nun hugging me, I thought that's, the, that's why I'm in this business. I didn't try to do that. I didn't manipulate anybody. It just hit her. That's been my mantra, my whole composing life. I do what I like to do. It's selfish, but it's the right thing to do. And if you like it, great. If you don't like it, you know, that's okay with me. I don't try to calculate or manipulate a lot of composers do nothing wrong with that it's just not my cup of tea how do you do that you're, you're talking about calculation or manipulation i mean where are... uh jumping on bandwagons larry uh for example when philip glass and steve reich hit right thousands of composers starting doing minimalism because well i guess is what everybody wants now 
And I think a lot of them, it wasn't sincere. They thought, well, it'll help me get my name out there. And again, that's fine. It's just not for me. I'd rather make less money or be less famous and just be, when I go to bed at night, I want to say, I love that thing that I just did today. Keeping and your voice, your voice, right? I mean, that's, whatever that's what it is. happens to be. Yeah. 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 I want to be really proud of it inside first. And to me, it's, um, it's not that it's art necessarily, it's just that it's personal. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, need, I need it to be right for me. I'm not an employee of the audience. I'm mm -hmm. an employee of, of me. Yeah. So, idealistically, when I was a graduate student, I used to say, you know, if one or two people like my piece, I'm thrilled. Now I'm up to five or six. <laughs> I need five or six to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so a final final question here to wrap sure. up. Um, have you ever been asked to guest conduct one of your pieces? <laughs> wow, that's a much more loaded question than you had ever. I'll try to give you the cliff notes. Many times. I'm not very good, but I really get a kick out of it. Uh, I've conducted other repertoire, but I'm not a Bernard Herrmann or Franz Waxman mm -hmm. type that loves to conduct. I'll do it if it's on a program that's a piece of mine. I'm, I'm okay. Only a few times, half a dozen times in my career. Um, I have to rent a tux. I don't have a tux. So I usually say, can I just wear a turtleneck, you know, kind of stand a Russo look. Uh, can I just wear a turtleneck and a black coat? And they usually say, that's fine. Rewind about 15 years ago, I had a big band wind ensemble commission from Capital University in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And when I got there, they said, Mike, we really want you to conduct your own piece. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this. And would you do the whole second half of the program? This is, you know, two days notice. I'm like, ah, sure, what the heck? It's a college, it doesn't matter. So in my piece, the band, the band piece uh, is called Gutter Snipe, which uh, I found out later, my my young Japanese wife said that was the piece that made her fall in love with me. So I'm not going to ask any questions. <laughs> so I'm conducting gutter snipe and I'm getting, I had just been through, there was a little holst thing, which I didn't like, but I, you know, just four, four, you don't have to really do anything. And a little bit of left hand. I, I love Stan's kind of Bella Lugosi left hand. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I did, I, I like doing that a little bit. Uh, I, I don't like this kind of mirror thing. So I like the independent. Uh, so I was able to do that with the whole stunt for gutter snipe. I was getting a little cocky in the middle. Meter changes everywhere. I'm sweating like a pig because I'm just a nervous wreck, right? There's a lullaby section in the middle where the lights come down and there's a soprano seated in the middle of the band, a secret surprise soprano who starts singing this lullaby with a muted trumpet and a euphonium. It's like little brass chamber ensemble. And I got, I, I just fell in love with that moment. I love that little tune in the midst of all this chaos. So I'm conducting and I thought, I'm going to do this, <laughs> right, okay? And I hold the stick in my left hand. I start going like this and it's beautiful, beautiful moment. Then I realize there's a page turn Oh crap, why well, I don't have any hands left. <laughs> so I reached over with this hand and the baton caught on the edge of the music stand and flipped out into the saxophone players who went like this. <laughs> and I thought, okay, okay. I became very humble as a conductor at that yeah. point. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really fun memory. This is not the piece where uh, somebody lights up a cigarette on stage, is it? No, that's Spider Baby. Spider Baby. Spy and Stan did Spider Baby at some point, too. It might have been it, when you were there. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah. how I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be the like the lower brass all light up cigarettes and put on sunglasses. I've gotten in a little trouble for that one, but um, yeah, kind of, kind of, you know, Mike Hammer at the end, kind of Perry Mason y feel. So yeah. Private yeah. eye thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow, you have an incredible memory to think of those. Well, I, I don't know. Jenny might argue with that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I seem to misremember things. Uh, you know, it's like, well, it wasn't quite that way, but it was close. Yeah, yeah. It was close. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. That's so, funny. well, this this has been great. I mean, what this. Treat, I'm man. so glad you said yes uh, to this. Are you kidding? What a great honor. This is what. Oh. This is a blast. I, I'm really. <laughs> uh, I, 
I only talk about myself when I'm forced to. When you guys ask me this question, that's one thing I learned from Copeland. The, the good guys don't have to talk about how good they are. Mm. And I thought, wow. And, and I said, so the big guys don't have to talk about a big guy. So that's pretty easy for you to say because you're a damn big guy, you know. But I'm just a little schmuck. I gotta, you know, promote. Uh, I, I, yeah. But, See, I, I don't was, think that though. It was a big. It was a big lesson to learn. Uh, and I and I I, I think uh, I, I meet so many composers that are so full of themselves. I, I won't name drop because it's inappropriate, but they know who they are, and you know, it's it's that's not my style, you know. Just. Oh, I wanted to tell you, uh, it, we'll wrap up with this, but you were asking, like, have I broadened my, uh, the people I've interviewed? I've interviewed an Elvis tribute artist, a San Francisco ballet ballerina turned Broadway star. Wow. And well, that might be two of the most, <laughs> the furthest away from trumpeters, but, you know, I'm trying to get the entertainment industry still. I think that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, those are oh, fun people to talk to. Us. That's fabulous. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I think that kind of eclecticism you can also promote. Like, well, next week, stay tuned for something a little off the beaten path. You know that. I yeah. Think, yeah. Keep up the good work, man. Thank you. All right. You All bet. Right, Take brother. care. Bye bye. Take care.